Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for uh, what I hope will be a, a candid but nonetheless enlightening conversation about trends, fearlessness, and communication. Joining us from uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, is uh, Marianne Salzman, Senior Vice President Global Communications with Philip Morris, a world-renowned trend spotter. Thank you for joining us, Marianne. Thank you for having me. Marianne, uh, you once wrote that there's no magic to being a trend spotter. You said it's mostly about being alert to prevailing winds and being quick and a little brave to call out what you see. So let's start with the beginning. Uh, why and how did you start spotting trends and writing about them? So it was totally happenstance. I was working in and around market research. I was very young. I looked very young. Um, I would often get teen assignments and I started putting together um, cumulative learnings, let's say, from a series of um, market research assignments. I, I shared them with friends that were working in the media, as many, you know, 20 something New Yorkers were, and it began to spiral into something. And then I would see my name and it would say Marion Salzman trend spotter. And I'd have to giggle because for me, I was just Marion Salzman doing my job. And from, from here on, you started spotting trends that made the, the headlines. You introduced the world to the term metrosexual, which uh, I think will be memorialized on your tombstone. Uh, I think That's you, what I keep saying. <laughs> you once said it. I, I really think it will be true. Now, that's arguably, unarguably, your greatest trend spotting success. But I'm sure you've also had many blunders in this profession. Uh, would you share some of those? Maybe the greatest one? My greatest blunder is sort of um, famous. Um, it was in the 90s, very early 90s, I guess. Uh, Michael Jackson had just been indicted for child molestation. And I went on to Net Nightline, which at that point was probably the number one um, nightly news show in the U.S. And I said, yeah, yeah, celebrity endorsers are dead, unless you're talking about somebody as competent and qualified as O.J. Simpson. And around two weeks later, O.J. Simpson took off in the white Bronco. And that was definitely my biggest blunder. I often say that my big trend blunders, though, happen not um, in the sighting, but when I narrow it down to a real level of specificity. So it's very easy to get the big cultural observation, the big commercial op uh, observation clear. It's much, much um, tougher when you narrow it down so I might say to you that organic or natural food, really, really important. But if I tell you that chickpea flour, I might get that part wrong. So, so it's a bit like weather forecasting. In the past, you could get the, the large trends, but it would still be very difficult to, 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 to forecast on, on, on the spot. And, and did this forecasting ability that you've uh, developed and honed through, the, through, through, through time, did it help you to adapt to this ever-changing industry of PR and advertising? Oh, I would say it's been the linchpin of my career. I think it's been the linchpin of news creation. Um, when I think about the great moments I've had on behalf of clients, on behalf of, let's say, PMI now, it's having this sixth sense, this sense of what's going to happen next and being able to navigate my story um, through that filter. So I would say that... Um, my best creativity has been as a, as a byproduct of my ability to anticipate what's going to happen in 18, 36, 48 months from now. Uh, fearlessness, Marianne, is, uh, is another name for bravery, which is the topic, the subject of today's conference. And you once said that this is your uh, characteristic, being fearlessness. Can you, can you share a bit how has this shaped your career? How, why is this important to you? So I have no fear of failure because I have an expectation that some things aren't going to work out and I have to pick myself up and keep going. I always make a deal with myself. Um, if I have a failure, if I have a mishap, I'm allowed um, 12 hours in my bed with my duvet pulled up and then I have to go back to it. Um, so I have absolutely no reservations about not succeeding at something. And as a consequence of that, it's much easier to be braver and take risks. And how did that come to pass? Many people, I would say, most people are afraid of failure. Is this something that uh, you were brought up without or was something that you resolved in your adulthood? 
Look, I think some of that is um, a byproduct of doing athletics um, growing up, never being all that good, but always wanting to be on and always making the team. I think some of that had to do with the fact that as a young teenager, um, I was an exchange student. So I went from America by myself before the internet, when you still had to mail letters home with the post office uh, and lived in Birmingham, England. So I think there were a lot of occasions when I did risky things and they proved to be worth it, the, the reward proved to be worth the risk. Um, and I guess I just got either more and more brave or more and more fearless and also just willing to try pretty much anything as long as it was, when the, it was legal. With this uh, fear and fearlessness, I'm curious, is this what fueled your rise, your, your ascension in, um, in the industry, uh, you know, to many still a male-dominated industry and you are a female leader of it. How much fearlessness has played a part in it? I was going to say, I think part of being fearless has been being able to be um, alongside male colleagues and not being intimidated to be initially maybe one of few women in the room. I mean, obviously, when you first start out, there were lots of women starting out in marketing and advertising when I did. As I moved into my 30s, it became more and more unique as I rose in the agency world. I, I, it's, certainly, it's certainly never bothered me. Um, it, 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 it made me want to advance the careers of other women, but it didn't bother me to be the only woman, let's say, on a business trip or the only woman at a meeting. I just felt it was my, my challenge, my opportunity. I, 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 I think the part that was brave maybe was I was about 30 when the internet came along in this popular way and I fearlessly plunged into the internet. And I always argue it gave me back 10 years of my youth because I was online 1992, 1993, um, doing instant messenger, chatting with people around the world. I started a market research company that did that. It was the first one on America Online. I was completely fearless because I didn't know any better. And my attitude was, well, if I fail, okay, I'll just keep going. In, in which ways were you thinking that you might fail? Were you fearing it might all be a bubble? I, I knew from the first moment it wasn't a bubble. I did a project for a sneaker company going back to 1993. And at that point in the U.S., the average um, height of an American woman I believe was 5'3". The average weight was 168 pounds. But I discovered this insight online that online every, in those days, online every woman was Sharon Stone and every male was Kevin Costner. And quite honestly, since every woman I knew in the supermarket wasn't Sharon Stone and every man I knew mowing his lawn wasn't Kevin Costner, I knew that there was this insight that people could find in an alternative self in the online world And I, um, early on, began predicting that women would start exchanging emails with their sisters, their moms, their best friends, and that the internet was going to become feminized very quickly. And I was early to do market research that way. And I really, really benefited. No, I never thought it was going to be a bubble. I am not the least bit surprised by what it is today. What I think is going to be interesting is that our schools are going to largely move online through much more than just COVID. I think we're going to see people adapting to the trend of constantly upskilling and they're going to commute to schools around the world from their own desktops or their own mobile telephones. Thank you for sharing that. How about another moment that you consider to be, I think this was your bravest moment, but how about another brave moment from your history in the industry where you used fearlessness to advance? Um, Look, many people would say giving up the luxury of being the C CEO at Havas PR to come to Philip Morris certainly was um, one of those moments. I'd actually say that moment was back in 1990, I guess end of 1994, when Shia Day um, began to merge with TBWA. And they asked me if I wanted to go be responsible for new media in Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And on six weeks notice, I moved from um, New York City to Amsterdam. I just took with me my then golden retriever puppy. Um, and we upped and moved to a foreign country. It took me about three weeks to realize all Dutch speak, all, most Dutch speak really good English and that I would be just fine. 
Um, and I, yeah, I, I became sort of a professional expat as a single American woman, quite young. Um, that was probably the toughest thing I faced, um, mostly because back in the 90s, being female in Europe was very different than being female in America. And I had to get used to all of the different rules of engagement. It was way before um, the sense of inclusion and diversity. It was way before you saw um, young women coming out of university aspiring to leadership positions. So it was, a, it was really an adventure. It was great. It was a total adventure, though. So you're saying at the time Europe was lagging a bit behind in, uh, culturally? You, you know what? Um, lagging behind on gender diversity. I mean, I think even today, if I was doing the same job I do, but doing it in America, I would be surrounded, I think, by lots, lots more um, women of similar stature in the corporate world. Um, I feel in Europe, it, it, I think Europe is, is following on that same trajectory, but I think women um, come in at a slower, came in historically at a slower pace. I shouldn't say come in today at a slower pace because I don't think that's fair. But I think that my generation in Europe didn't come in. Um, they didn't engage and they certainly didn't aspire or get the opportunities I had as an American woman. Thank you. Thank you for saying that and for role modeling in the end, you know, what should be true gender diversity in, in organizations. Listen, while we're on the topic of bravery, I want to point something out. You are a, a free time brain tumor survivor, and I'm able yeah. to share this because you spoke about it uh, candidly on your blog, on social media, with the media at the time. And I, I think, you know, it's great showing such vulnerability and disclosing something so personal. So would you be able to tell us, you know, how, has this ex how have these experiences shaped your perspective on life? What's the greatest lesson you learned from them? So there's three lessons I learned. When I fly on an airplane, I don't tell the pilot what to do. When I go for brain surgery, I don't direct the neurosurgeon. I say, thank you very much. Um, that's one. It's like you can't control everything. The second one is pick what you can control and focus on it. So I have this long hair. I'm kind of an old lady to have this long hair. And that is my brain tumor defense system because I had my last brain tumor removed just in March of this year. And I was back online at meetings um, three days after my brain surgery. And everyone's like, you look completely normal because I have this great hidden helmet of hair. Um, so I, this time I have 80 or something stitches and staples in my head, but no one could see it. And the third thing was, um, don't hide what's going on. You have to bring your whole self to work. It would have been completely idiotic for me not to be open about the fact I was going for brain surgery. I might be out for one day, five days, five weeks, five months, or the rest of my life. I was very, very open, which made it very easy when I came back. I came back super quickly. Each time from my brain surgery, I've been back to work within two or three weeks um, online. Um, when I came back, I sort of had headaches for about a month and a half. It made it really easy to say, hey, guys, I'm going to do six hours today, but then I have to go to sleep. Thank you. So now tell me, how does this brave female leader from the communication industry, who's not even afraid of brain surgery, a world-renowned trend spotter, join a, an industry that everybody loves to hate, the tobacco industry? How did you make okay. that decision? There's another piece of it, too. I'm a never smoker. And a never you know smoker. What? Right. Um, you know what? When they first called me up, I will tell you, um, it was a headhunter. I was walking home in New York City. My husband is a law professor. He'd gone back to, he teaches at, or he was teaching at that point. He's associated with the University of Arizona. I was in New York City. All the kids had gone back to college or were now finally adults. And I was walking home after moving back into our New York City apartment. I'd been waiting a decade to get back and live my New York life and go to Arizona every other weekend. And a headhunter called me and she starts describing this company and I said, um, you're describing a company that sounds like Unilever. I know it's not Unilever. So could you just tell me what fast moving consumer good company you're talking about? And she finally said it was Philip Morris. And I said, well, that's completely ridiculous. I am not a smoker. I'm not interested. I don't know what you're talking about. And I was very high and mighty about it. And I went home and I actually was talking to my husband on the phone that night. And I said, I got the most insulting phone call. They have the nerve to ask me to interview at Philip Morris. And he must have been Googling at his desk in the office because he said, Marion, do you know what business Philip Morris is in? I said, of course I do. And he said, I think they're in a business in transformation. 
He said, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's electron. And I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then I decided I better get my computer out. And I started reading about the transformation. And I sheepishly called the woman at Hydric and Struggles back the next morning and said, you know, I've said I wasn't interested. I'm kind of not really interested because I love my job, but it's kind of a cool company. And then um, it was a mutual courtship for about six or eight months because I didn't really know that I wanted the job. I didn't know I wanted to move to Switzerland. I, I sort of loved my job at Havas. I didn't know if I wanted to go and face the hate. Um, and by the time I arrived, I, I, we started the conversation, I guess, in August of 2017, when I arrived in April of 18, I had decided I disagreed. I believe that people have the right to make better choices. I believe that I could be part of unsmoking the planet. I believed that our investment in science and technology was really worthy of promoting and publicizing. So by the time I got here, I had no reservations about what I was going to be asked to do. But, but joining Philip Morris was no walk in the park, especially for someone like you, who was a well-known uh, uh, professional. So uh, how did you take in the, the initial reaction and also the, the ones in the months that followed? Not, not all of it has, has been kind. No, much of it isn't kind. I, I, I manage it on the 80-20 rule. 20% of the people are just going to write me off because this is where I work. 80% of the people are going to hear me out because of what I might represent personally, because they understand the company and its pivot. Um, and all I've actually argued for is that people entertain a civil and civilized dialogue with us. I don't need you to agree with my choice. I don't need you to believe our science until we prove it to you. But I only ask that you're polite, and willing to listen, and I'm going to be willing to listen to the criticism in exchange. No, it, it's been rough. I mean, there's been times when I've been bombarded by hate. There's been times when people have challenged my sanity for taking this job. I think you have to just suck it up and, and say, I know why I'm doing it. I know the trajectory we're on. I understand that there's going to be bumps in the road. I really have faith in our science and our commitment to doing better. I mean, I've been very enthusiastic about launching our Unsmoke campaign that starts off with, if you don't smoke, don't start. If you smoke, quit. If you won't quit, change. And those words are all very deliberate. I'm not out there publicizing or promoting bringing new people into a tobacco franchise. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And just for those who are willing to listen, as you say, what do you respond to those who say you are simply out to make tobacco fashionable again? I, I mean, my first under my breath response is that's har highly unlikely given I don't use the product. Um, it's followed immediately by, well, actually, the, the, the hardest part of my job is that I don't have a PhD in either engineering or biotechnology, and that kind of um, brain, brain power is essential in really understanding the transformation we are working on. If you're really rude to me, my attitude is, I hope someday you regret not learning more about us, but there's enough people that want to engage and have a constructive dialogue, I'll find someone else to talk to. So, Marian, two years ago, I was uh, in your office pondering myself on the decision on whether to join or not the company, and I asked you a question. I said, what did you learn in the, in the past year since you joined? So let me ask that question again now, three years on, after you've joined Philip Morris. What did you learn? How, how do you look at things differently with three more years of information? Okay, the first thing I learned was um, that there's a stereotype around tobacco executives and that my greatest asset is I don't look like a tobacco executive. That was the first thing I, I think I've learned in hindsight is if you can open a dialogue with someone, they're probably likely to dialogue with you. The hardest part is opening it up. The next thing I, I, I'd say really now, and it's really four years into my relationship with PMI, it's three and a half years plus since I joined the company, um, the cultural differences, I think in the introduction, you guys mentioned that I've been very, very keen for 20 years on hyper-localization, but I think we are all becoming more nuanced and more committed to both the global world, but a very local neighborhood of people who share our attitudes, beliefs, and values. And I think that as communicators, 
we need to genuinely understand our target audience. So the importance of that insight, whether it's a consumer insight, it's a cultural insight, it's an insight into the law and mindset of the political climate of a country. What I could say um, in Brazil might bear no resemblance to what I can say in Bulgaria, might bear no resemblance to what I can say in Romania, might be completely irrelevant in Japan. And I have to really do my homework and understand the local news before I can um, project myself or our company into the global dialogue. Thank you. Think globally, but communicate locally. I think that's a very good mantra. We only have time for one more question. You know, you're a tobacco executive, but you're still a trend spotter. You've launched at the beginning of uh, this year uh, what you called Zoom's Day predictions, your trend uh, forecast for 2021. Now, looking back, could you, could you describe uh, what are the trends that you think came through and the ones that didn't? Or maybe you could give us a sneak peek to 2022. Okay, so let me give you a sneak peek in the one minute to 2022. I think that chaos is going to be normal. I think Mother Nature has declared war on us, the citizens of the planet. Um, I think that the chaos of inequities, the chaos of um, the political climate globally, when combined with climate, is going to make it a very tumultuous um, near-term road. Um, I think that people are going to um, spend a lot more time trying to connect virtually to blunt um, those connections they can't make face to face. So I think we're going to finally enter an era where um, parallel universes, this hybrid lifestyle is going to be genuinely normal. You're going to do some of your work from home. You're going to do some of your shopping from home. I, I think home is going to become your new command central in ways that we haven't seen before. Thank you very much, Marianne. Thank you for this uh, truly enlightening conversation. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining in, for, for listening. And uh, until, uh, until next time, enjoy this amazing conference. Uh, be brave and uh, learn more things. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much.